I'm Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, and it's time to get wealthy. You're going to learn exactly what you need to know and do to finally achieve the level of financial success you desire and you deserve. Why is the wealth gap so wide? Well, the stats say that African Americans have one tenth the wealth of white families, 143,000 versus a million dollars. Well, in an explosive new book, my guest today shares why a lot of that gap is caused by the financial industry itself. She is the author of The White Wall, How Big Finance is, it, How Big Finance is Bankrupting Black Americans. But here are the three things they don't want you to know about building wealth while Black. First, your income or assets will not give you access to many of the privileges that our white counterparts get. In addition, systemic racism has really prevented African Americans from building the kind of wealth that they could if the, level, if the playing field were level. And then finally, financial services companies make it really difficult for Blacks in the industry itself to succeed. Well, our guest today is here to shed some light on this topic. She's Emily Flitter. She is, she covers banking and Wall Street for the New York Times. She's had a pretty long career in, as a journalist, and this is her first book. And that's why I'm excited to have this conversation with her today. So Emily, welcome to Get Wealthy. It's great to be here, Deborah. Thank you so much for having me. My first question to you, however, is, did you ever imagine that this topic would be the, the subject of your first uh, uh, becoming an author? No, I didn't. But once I saw the magnitude of this problem, I knew it had to, to be an entire book. In fact, I could have written an entire book just on the insurance industry and its racism. I think there need to be many, many books on this subject. And I, I knew that I needed a book length piece of writing to even begin to describe all the facets of this problem. Well, let me tell you a, a, a funny story. When your article broke in the New York Times about the football player going into that office, that investment company office, I actually knew someone at JP Morgan. And I gave them a call to say, wow, what are you guys going to do about this? And they said, oh, it's interesting that you called. We're having a meeting with a, a lot of black leaders and we'd love for you to come up. And it was the very next day I hop on a train to New York and I sit in this room. And what was really, really interesting about their leadership is how uh, perplexed uh, they were about something like this at actually happening uh, to one of their customers. So that's where I want to start. You know, in uh, Get Wealthy, we have a framework of financial success that we put through the lens of mindset, strategy, and execution. And I think this is a great conversation to have around that framework, uh, Emily, in that the first thing I want to cover is mindset. And, you know, for so often we, we deal with these financial institutions and we don't really understand that the, the racist, systemic policies that they have. So I, I, I want to start there with you just about from your own perspective, what do you think the mindset that a gentleman like this football player you wrote about who had, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars, but still wasn't just just give our viewers a little our, a little background on what happened, because that was the article itself that kind of brought a lot of this to light. That's right. That article was the sort of thing that kicked off the effort that I have been making over the past few years to to cover this topic. Um, 
the story is about a black NFL player or retired NFL player who went to a JP Morgan Chase branch in Phoenix and wanted to deposit his money and get the perks of uh, that JP Morgan Chase offers wealthy bank customers. So if you have $250,000 in a JP Morgan Chase account, you can have all of these extra little things like tickets to events and discounts on museum access and travel discounts and even discounted uh, loan rates. And um, it, it, in some, in many cases, the bank really reaches out to people who they think are wealthy enough to qualify for this uh, program, which is called Chase Private Client. And they say like, you know, please sign up for this. We'd love to have you. Um, and it's a prestige thing. And uh, it just gives them it, an extra level of sort of interaction with these clients. So um, Jimmy Kennedy is the NFL player who, um, has certainly earned enough money during his time in the NFL to qualify for this program. When I interviewed him, he said he had in various bank accounts about $900,000. And whenever he would visit his mother in, um, in Los Angeles, the, he would go to the bank with her and the, the, the tellers all knew who he was and they would say, oh, you have to come over to Chase and be a Chase private client. But he didn't live in LA, he lived in Phoenix. And so he finally decided, okay, I'm gonna go to Chase. I'm gonna move my money from the other banks and put it in Chase and become a private client. So he goes there, he moves his money and for some reason they won't make him a private client. And he's like waiting and he's got this investment advisor who he actually really likes. And then that person who's actually another main character in this story gets fired um, after complaining about racial discrimination. So now Jimmy is alone. He doesn't really have an advocate at Chase. The managers are white. He's assigned another investment advisor who is black. And he keeps saying, why am I not getting the benefits that I signed up for? And the, the new investment advisor says, it's because they're afraid of you because you're a big black man and they don't want to deal with you. And um, this was an explosive story. I mean, that's, that's really the tip of the iceberg. There was a lot more going on at this Chase branch. Emily, that's insane that uh, here you are, you're you're like uh asking them to take my money that's that's what i find so insane about just the treatment uh that this nfl player he did know what he qualified for and yet the did the the new uh uh account executive did he could he explain is his explanation was he wasn't getting these benefits because they were afraid of him? Yes. So, um, and we know this because Jimmy, the NFL player, actually recorded these conversations. And I, I, I just want to uh, make one little interjection and that will, will show you how insane this is. After the story came out and people read about the difficulty that Jimmy got, had trying to get chase private client status. I heard from so many people, all of whom were white, who said that Chase had actually said, look, we don't even care if you don't have all $250,000 in cash. Like it's really like we can just, you know, uh, put some other assets together on paper and, you know, you should apply for this anyway. So, I mean, they are trying to hand this status out to certain people, but for Jimmy, it's like his money wasn't good enough. So, um, so anyway, he, he, he knew something was wrong. So he started recording his conversations with his investment advisor, whose name was Charles and Charles was also black. And in one of the recordings, Jimmy says, why am I not getting private client status? And Charles says, look, as a black man, I, you know, you, I can talk to you like this and like, you know, we're in Phoenix, Arizona. They don't see a lot of people who look like you and me. And you're also enormous. 
you know, you're in, you were in the NFL and they're just afraid that if they tell you that there's been this little kind of hiccup in processing your paperwork, that you're going, they don't know what you're going to do and they're afraid. And, um, and Jimmy said, well, so do you think it's racism? And the, and Charles replied, well, I don't think that they're blatantly racist, but I think everybody, you know, in their position sort of has a little bit of that inside them. And that's interesting. And goes it, interesting in that, you know, here's what, what, what I, what, why that, why your, your initial story intrigued me is because, you know, certainly I come out of that industry. I mean, I actually was responsible for uh, managing advisors, hiring ad advisors. Now, this is more than two decades ago. And to think that this still is uh, prevalent uh, prior to starting uh, Wealthy You, I had no idea that so much of this was going on. Certainly, you know, when I went into a lot of financial services institutions, after I left the industry, many of those companies became clients and I would do seminars and workshops for them. And I would go into these, you know, companies and say, why is there a lack of diversity? Why aren't, you know, here it is two decades later and there's still very few uh, blacks, people of color, uh, even women in the industry as well. And so what I, what, what I discovered though, after starting Wealthy You and really, educating people about how they could, you know, how they need to look at their finances. In one case, I actually went to a company with someone and she was about to deposit $35,000. And they basically just threw her an application and said, here, pick what you want. And I was like, well, aren't you going to sit down with this person and kind of go over what their goals and objectives are and give them some insight into what would be an appropriate investment. She says, oh, you have to have an appointment for that. And I was like, oh, well, how do we get an appointment? She says, oh, well, you'll have to call. And so what is what is happening? And so then I see your story and I'm like, man, this is like standard operating procedure. And so Emily, the, the next guest question I have for you just about, you know, how you discovered this based on this, the, what you've learned, what do you think African-Americans need to be aware of when they're dealing with these financial institutions to ensure that they're getting the kind of access to privileges that they should be? Well, it's a really, that's a, a really tough question to answer because it is a fundamentally unfair setup and it's not the fault of any of the would-be customers who aren't getting this treatment. So just like in the example that you gave where you accompanied someone who wanted to open an investment account and was and and when she went to open the account, she just wasn't offered the level of service and the level of advice that other people were getting who were not black. Um, it's it's like, what do you do when you're faced with that and the there is really no good answer i think the best answer is there is a, a network of service providers out there who have all who are black who have experienced these abuses and know that they are out there and i and deborah you say you came from the industry i'm sure you've seen over the years how when black financial advisors start out and they may get some experience at wirehouses, they often leave and, and become RIAs, registered uh, investment advisors, which means that they can have an independent business and they don't have to answer to a huge management, management structure. Um, that happens a lot because it's just so hard to succeed at these big companies, but when a lot of uh, the RIAs start their own businesses. They actually start with the driven, with the goal to to make things easier for Black customers. And I actually, well, oh, sorry. No, go go right ahead. No, I mean because that was that was my question. You know, uh, first the first question I have for you. I mean, 
had Jimmy not recorded that conversation, it would have been very easy for the advisor and for the company itself to deny it. And I know that in some states, you can't record people without, you know, letting them know they're, record they're recorded. So, so would you, you know, based on your experience, does it make sense for people to record this inter these interactions so that uh, it can be uh, kind of uh, 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 ex exposed? That, I understand what you're asking now. And, you know, uh, I, I don't want to advise people to break the law. So, right. you know, you, as you pointed out, recording uh, somebody in certain states without their knowledge is illegal. Um, so assuming that you're that this interaction is taking place in a one party recording state, which means that only one of the two people talking has to know that the recording is happening, then I don't see why you shouldn't, you know, because with evidence, you can you can bring this to light, you can seek justice without a recording, it's so hard because, I, l actually, let me give you ex an example of what happened to Jimmy, who even even after he recorded, had a hard time getting justice. The first thing he did was file a complaint with the Arizona Attorney General's office, which is where discrimination complaints go. And JP Morgan just responded to the uh, claims that he was making in his complaint and said, they're not true. And the Arizona AG just was like, okay, we believe JP Morgan. And only after I wrote a story, was there any other movement on that case? And so I think, yes, I don't, I think people who are facing this treatment have the tool uh, of modern technology at their disposal to, um, to, to, to make the recording, but then that's only the first step. You got to make the recording and then you have to use it. You have to call people out, call me, which I'm always, I love to hear from people. Um, <laughs> well, that was my other, material. <laughs> yeah. Well, that was my other, uh, you know, the other point that I was making, because had you not written that story, uh, that story was a catalyst. The story of Jimmy, the NFL player in the New York Times, really was a catalyst for a lot of other things coming to light. In fact, uh, one of the points that you made, just talking about how difficult it is for African Americans to succeed in you know, the, the traditional wirehouse, your large financial services organizations, the gentleman who was the original advisor to Jimmy was fired. And, and in the book, can, can you just share with our audience what happened to this gentleman and what actually came to light after your story, after you reported on this? Yes, so Ricardo Peters was an, a highly driven, ambitious, and, and amazingly accomplished JP Morgan Chase employee. He started out in a call center and he worked his way all the way up to being a financial advisor. And he wanted more. He wanted to be an advisor to Chase private clients. And as we already know, those are the people who have some real money to invest. And to be a private client advisor, you actually have to have this, this status. They're called um, CPCs. Um, and so it's like, it's, it's one step above being a retail financial advisor. And um, Ricardo really wanted that. And he felt like his boss, uh, who actually was the same man who wouldn't process Jimmy's uh, Chase private client application, um, was really like not, he like he was not letting him advance to this level and he was also really not saying why and um so ricardo started recording his conversations with his boss and his boss said i don't think you're going to be right for being in this program and ricardo was like why and he said well i just don't think the market is going to support us you know, giving somebody else this title. And Ricardo was like, but I have all of these clients who are wealthy now. And Ricardo was frustrated because 
his clients, when they reached a certain level of wealth, were actually being taken away from him and given to people with the status. It seemed really unfair. So in one of the conversations that he had with his boss, he said, what about this woman who I just brought in as a new client? He, he mentioned her name and um, her background was that she was black. She had had a son who had died in a tragic way that required the city or municipality where her son died to give her a settlement that was worth about $400,000. So plenty of money to qualify as a Chase private client. And Ricardo pointed this out and his boss said, well, you know, she's from Section 8 and she didn't earn it and she didn't, um, you're not investing. He said, you're not investing a dime for this lady because this isn't money she earned and she doesn't respect it. And that is insane, Emily. Come insane. On. <laughs> this gentleman has no compassion and no empathy. And his point of view and perspective is that because this was some kind of windfall, that she wouldn't, what, she'd be a spendthrift and she wouldn't invest the money? Or was that his train of thought? It was. That's that's how he said it. He was like, you know, I've seen it before. For in twelve to twenty four months, this this money is going to be gone. Yeah, uh, you're not investing a dime for her. And Ricardo actually said to him, "Isn't that what we're for as financial advisors? Is to show her how to be a steward of this money and make it grow." And well, you you know what, Emily? As I read that, you know, I thought about just the the gymnastics that Ricardo had to do in order to navigate his way in this world, right? Even proving himself and everything that meeting the requirements of being this private client advisor and yet still not being given the opportunity that that these these biases and this, you know, this these races basically uh, perspectives of the people who are in leadership and are responsible for you being able to go to the next level, trying to be respectful, but at the same time, you know, my heart just went out to him just about how he felt and even having that conversation with his direct manager. So when we come back, the next thing I want to talk about is strategy, right? Like, uh, when we come back, folks, we're going to our strategies set, uh, segment. What do you, as a uh, uh, African American, what can you do to succeed in spite of what uh, the explosive findings in this book and what uh, Black Americans have to go through in order to succeed in the financial services industry itself? Don't go anywhere, folks. We'll be right back. Let's be honest, as successful women, we're crushing it. Maxed out 401k and Roth IRA? Check. Aggressive savings and investments? Check. Yet, the freedom our success was supposed to buy can leave us stuck on the six-figure hamster wheel, watching retirement slip further down the road. There's another way. Get coaching courses and community at WealthyU.com. Welcome back, everyone. I'm Deborah Owens. This is Get Wealthy, and we're talking about the difficulty of being able to acquire wealth for Black Americans. Joining me today is Emily Flitter. She is the author of The White Wall, How Big Finance is Bankrupting African Americans. So you know what, Emily, that's where I want to go next, and that strategy. When you think of you and your book, you go, you have story after story of people trying to do the right thing and just being met with all of these racist obstacles. So I, I want to talk a little bit now about your book has been out now for a few months. Uh, you've been getting feedback. You've gotten a lot of insight. 
what kind of strategies do, do from your point of view do black folks need to, to to employ in order to succeed in spite of these obstacles that we're faced with well uh, as i mentioned in the first segment there are uh, one really important thing is to seek out allies in the financial industry um, institutions and people who say that they recognize these problems for how big and how deep they are and that they are mission driven in their attempts to uh, change to make change. So forget about the rhetoric that the big banks and other big financial institutions in um, corporate America are, are, you know, constantly producing for the public there. It's meaningless. Um, all of the, you know, we value diversity. We have no tolerance for racism. It's it's meaningless. You, you need to find institutions who say, uh, we are are here, we exist to serve black customers. Um, we exist to counteract racism in the wider financial in industry. And those institutions are out there. Um, in my book, I write about a woman actually who was at JP Morgan as a financial advisor and then as a, a manager and she has now gone out on her own as a um, r running an investment advisory firm that recruits black advisors um, and makes sure that they are nurtured. So that's, you know, if you want to get into the industry, that kind of um, setup is a really good setup. Uh, but um, beyond that, Deborah, I really think that, first of all, there's a, an entire component of this that really it, it should not be the responsibility of black employees or customers. White uh, managers and the, the people with the power need to change. And, um, and, and that's, not, that's not on uh, African Americans. They, they are victims of this treatment and not, it, it's like, it's not- You're absolutely fault. right. Uh, um, you know, I just wonder, uh, someone like you, did did you in your wildest dream even, uh, you, you get this story, you, at first you don't, uh, you know, in the book you talk about whether or not this was really a story that you could pursue. And then you, through your, uh, through your research, found, you know, a woman who's been fighting <laughs> the systemic aspect of this, uh, of the, financial services industry itself and it's the racism being systemic within it. Did you ever in your wildest dream, as you, you know, interviewed these people, think that this was actually going on? Well, I, you know, at first I was, I behaved as a journalist is trained to behave, which is that you are presented with a set of facts. You have to listen to everybody's angle and you know synthesize things um and and figure out what the real story is and um what i realized and why i wrote the book is that when you get presented with a set of facts in any individual situation where where someone is saying i was i'm the victim of discrimination i am being mistreated because of the color of my skin there is a huge context if you don't have the context you're like looking at it a lot of times like, oh, it's he said, she said, and what can be proved. But the context is that this whole system is racist. And if you lose that, you're just not doing individuals who are uh, victims of this abuse justice. So when you say, did I ever imagine? I mean, I, I, I do journalism in order to, to bring um, abuses to light. Uh, that's what I think is really important about journalism is that it's sometimes really the last stand that you can take is telling your story publicly. It, it makes people um, able to internalize your experience, sympathize, and then it gives them energy to make a change. And what we need right now is for the whole system and its leaders to understand how shameful this is and to make a drastic change. Well, the other question I have for you, though, really is that, yes, you've, you've, you, you, it's not, it, what this led to you to find was that it's not just 
in, 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 you know, in the investment side of the financial services industry that it kind of, it's a thread that weaves itself throughout every aspect of the industry. You brought up insurance, which I also <laughs> have been employed by one of the largest firms uh, in the property and casualty area. I, will, I, I think what's important is for you to tie how these discriminatory practices really are impacting the wealth gap. Uh, great question. It's, it, and actually that's kind of um, the source of the title of my book, it being a wall. And like all of these different components of the industry are like bricks in the wall. So if you look at the insurance industry, I wrote about how if you have an insurance policy, let's say you, you know, you have homeowner's insurance, something goes wrong, like your roof starts leaking, like a tree falls on it, whatever. The way insurance is supposed to work is that the insurer is supposed to pay to fix your roof. You've been paying into the policy, now it's their turn to give you back some money so you can make this repair. That's how you preserve the value of your home. That's how you preserve your own finances when something big and unexpected and expensive happens. But insurers won't pay claims made by black claimants in the, with the same ease as white claimants. And actually, there's a new study. It's not in my book because it just came out um, that actually compared the, the claims process for white claimants and black claimants uh, for State Farm. And what is the effect of this? Well, it just means that you, if you're black and you have a house and something bad happens and you can't get the same payout uh, with the same speed and ease, you're, you're losing money. And how are you supposed to build wealth? How are you supposed to build momentum in building wealth when everything is harder? Yeah, I mean, it's like it's a black tax, right? So let's take insurance, for example. One of the things I found fascinated when I, uh, I won't say fascinated, kind of ticked me off, right? Is to be poor is expensive is more expensive, right? So if you, what many people don't know is part of your premium is based on your credit score, which makes absolutely no sense to me because in most cases, there is an actually actual asset that you're insuring. So why would it make sense to penalize people who are on the margins who typically if you have a low credit score, it is difficulty paying your bills, but you, it costs you more. If you look at living in urban areas, right? The cost of insurance costs so much more than it, if you were to just move two blocks away. And so basically what is happening is that it costs more for you to live therefore, just to take care of your basic needs. So therefore you have less discretionary income left over so that you can put towards saving and, and investing. And the other question that I have for you is, what other, was there something that you discovered that you had no idea was really, people were re really being impacted by? Wow, what a great question. Um, I. The insurance thing was a really interesting discovery. Um, I uh, also was um, just really uh, shocked when I took a, a close look at the racial equity pledges that the banks made in 2020. Specifically, I looked at JP Morgan's, which was the biggest, $30 billion, they said, would go toward their own efforts to close the racial wealth gap. And when you look at what it really is, it's money that JP Morgan is now categorizing as helping close the racial wealth gap, but it's they're really just doing business. They're making mortgage loans. They're making loans to developers that um, are going to uh, low income housing, or at least the developers get the low income housing tax credit. We don't really know what the results of any of these things are and the lending to black mortgage borrowers, it remains incredibly low at JP Morgan as a percentage. Um, so I, I think it's really, it's really easy to get um, snowed by these huge financial firms, p 
public statements. And I would emphasize that so much of it is just such hot air. It is so meaningless. I yeah, think- it's a shell game, right? Yeah. So we're going to help you. And by helping you, we're going to benefit, right? So we're going to make all of these loans available, but they're loans, right? So from those loans, you are going to earn interest for, for them. And it's just going to make more money. I tell you, folks, you have got to get this book. It is The White Wall, How Big Finance is Bankrupting Black America. When we come back, we're going to our next sec- section and that our next segment. And that's all about execution. Once you get this information, now, what do you need to do as a result of it? That's what we're going to tackle when we come back. So don't go anywhere. Welcome back to Get Wealthy. I'm having a, fi- a, a fascinating conversation with Emily Flitter, the author of The White Wall. Now, Emily, we're going to tackle execution. And I think you really alluded to that in our last uh, uh, segment. And that's what do Black folks do? You talked about uh, the fact that Black folks need to you know, look for organizations and look for institutions that say they have your best interest at heart. And so to that end, you brought up something about registered investment advisors that it being difficult for uh, Black advisors to, to succeed in these big organizations. So they're starting their own. I do know specifically about an organization, Quad A, the Association of African American Financial Advisors. You can even go to their website. And if you're looking for a uh, a black financial advisor, that's one of the ways to find something in your location. Any other uh, uh, insights or organizations that you found in your reporting that could also be helpful in assisting our audience in you know, finding people that value uh, their their what they do and what they're trying to accomplish. Quad A is a great um, suggestion. They're in my book, um, and uh, I've met so many amazing people through Quad A. Um, and so that's that's just one part of the financial industry, though. Um, the uh, there there are black owned banks. There are unfortunately fewer black owned banks than there used to be. Um, but, but they, uh, are their own category. I mean, they're even regulators call them MDIs, minority depository institutions. That doesn't mean that they're not going to act like banks. Um, and there are, it's sort of problematic relationships that people can get into with any bank. But if you are looking, if you look up the list of MDIs, minority depository institutions, you're going to be looking at a list of banks that are run by people who understand that there is a very special set of difficulties that um, customers, black customers can face at a larger financial institution. Um, 
if you're moving beyond retail, like for instance, if you if you want to succeed on Wall Street, you know, I I interviewed people who um, were successful uh, on Wall Street and people who were so frustrated and so mistreated that they left. And they, you know, nobody offered advice that didn't have a very sort of grim implication. Um, it's uh, in my book, I talk about how hard it is to get any success or justice if you actually complain about being discriminated against. I'm not in a position to give advice, but what I can say is that it's really, HR is really designed to protect companies and not the people who are actually victims of abuse. So that's something to keep in mind. Thanks for those tips, uh, Emily. The Quad A and those kind of organizations, Black Banks, uh, the other organization that you mentioned, we're gonna make sure that we post those links so that when people are looking for organizations that are aligned to their specific needs and value them, they're somewhere to go. So when we come back, we're gonna go through what our, is our lightning round, analyze, optimize, and maximize based on all the information that Emily shared with us. So don't go anywhere, folks. We'll be right back. Black Star Network is here. Oh, no punch! It's a real um, revolutionary right now. Uh, thank you for being the voice of Black America. All the momentum we have now, we have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black-owned media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig? I'm Deborah Owens. You've been watching Get Wealthy, and uh, this has been a very enlightening and opening conversation about just the systemic racism that is banked into financial services itself and how difficult it can be in order for Black Americans to build wealth. Uh, thank, let's welcome back Emily Flitter. And Emily, you covered a lot of ground in this book. I mean, we just really touched the surface. To your point, it's just not the investment industry. It's also insurance. And another point you brought up was how artificial intelligence is really influencing the, the racism is kind of baked into that. So this is sort of our, our lightning round based on everything we covered. So I would love for you to just share with our viewers your biggest takeaway from this work. So do you feel like you've covered what you needed to or is there more for you to conquer? Well, I, I, I'm i glad that you asked it like that. I, I think one way to summarize the book is if you're if you're watching the show, if you read the book and you're black, it's the the bad stuff that you feel when you're dealing with the financial services industry is not your fault. It's not your fault and you don't deserve to be treated like this. And mm. um, if you if you have a bad if you get bad loan terms and you know if if somebody's not treating you right, it's just it's them, it's not you. And um, whether that means you demand better service or whether it means you go somewhere else, or whether it means you, you know, make a public stand, whatever it is. And I hate that it, that that work should have to be on the victims of abuse. Um, it's just, it's them, it's not you. So that's an important um, takeaway. Um, the other uh, takeaway that I hope readers um, who have power uh, to, to make changes in this industry understand is that I don't think that we're going to significantly change things without a significant truth and reconciliation program attached to reparations. And I think the financial industry should support a reparations program and do everything that they can to convince the US government to actually make reparations to black Americans. Well, you know, it is interesting. You started out talking, we didn't get to the conversation, but we did talk about the discovery that was made of uh, of uh, 
a grave of slaves where a building in Wall Street was uncovered for a new sky from a new skyscraper that was going up. But my my last question to you uh, really is, I I in reading the book, there are some other things that I'm sure you discovered that aren't in there. You know, one of the most egregious. Uh, 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 things that I'm finding in the in in our community is that people are being put in products and they're being charged a lot of fees. They can't get out of these different products. They're specific to the the uh, the insurance industry and are sold by investment companies as well. Did you encounter anything in your uh, in uh, in your research about how uh, these kinds of products are impacting? Uh, uh, not just black Americans, pretty much anybody who invests in them. Well, I actually, um, if you're talking about uh, exploitive predatory investment products, I, I have been writing about those for years. I mean, there are all kinds of scammy private placements and um, low end REITs that financial advisors put their customers in um, that, you know they they get them to sign off on things without really understanding what they're they're doing um yeah this is a big problem and in terms of um what can be done about it i i think that it's really difficult if you have a financial advisor and that person is telling you that they uh that you should get into this product and you don't really understand it um because i oftentimes what the advisor will say is, well, I'm the expert here, so you should just trust me. And I mean, yeah, you have to figure out if if you trust that person. And I would not in like 99% of the cases, you know, if you don't understand it, don't do it. Even if it's like there's like a little warning bell, I would listen to that. That's exactly right. And that's exactly, Emily, why we launched Wealthy You and Why Get Wealthy is on Black Star Network. I just want to thank you for coming on Get Wealthy. And I, I hope your book is a great success because not only do Black Americans need to read it, I think all Americans need to read it so that they can really understand how pervasive racism is and how it influences and impacts every area of our lives. Definitely. Thanks so much for coming on Get Wealthy. Thank you for having me. This has been a real pleasure. Good, excellent. So when I come back, the three takeaways from today's show, don't go anywhere. I'll be right back. When you talk about blackness and what happens in black culture, we're about covering these things that matter to us uh, speaking to our issues and concerns. This is a genuine people-powered movement. There's a lot of stuff that we're not getting. You get it, and you spread the word. We wish to plead our own cause to long have others spoken for us. We cannot tell our own story if we can't pay for it. This is about uh, covering us. Invest in Black-owned media. Your dollars matter. We don't have to keep asking them to cover our stuff. So please support us in what we do, folks. We want to hit 2,000 people, $50 this month, raise $100,000. We're behind 100000 so we want to hit that. Y'all money makes this possible. Check some money orders. Go to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037-0196. The cash app is dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zelle is rolling at rollingsmartin.com. Thanks everyone, I'm Deborah Owens and thank you for watching Get Wealthy. Here are the three takeaways from today's show. The first thing is financial ignorance is expensive. You really, really need to understand what is happening and the kind of decisions that you're making when it comes to your money. Secondly, financial advisors are compensated, not based on the return that they're going to give you, but based on the assets that you bring in. So make sure you choose wisely. And then finally, read the fine print and the fees that are associated 
with the decisions and the investment decisions that you're making. That's going to do it for us on this episode of Get Wealthy. Keep watching because we're going to keep coming up with information that is going to help you achieve the financial success that you deserve. I'm Deborah Owens. This is Get Wealthy only on Black Star Network.